Hi, welcome to our first guest episode of Breaking the Spell. Today our guest is Santosh Kumar, and uh, thanks for joining us. For the, thanks for joining Douglas and I. We're really pleased to have you. Um, so I met you, you know, earlier this year, and I think we bonded over a lot of different ideas. Um, and Douglas recently got to know you when you gave like a presentation on Global Degrowth Day. Um, yeah, Douglas, did you wanna? Say yeah. Any? So like, uh, I think it was a good uh, presentation that you gave, and you know, for today. You know, perhaps we'll go through some of those points, right? Uh, especially regarding your experience uh, studying in France, and you had some civil service experience, which we both share. Uh, so we we'll go through a little bit of that as well. I'd be interested, uh, be interested to know about your thoughts uh, regarding many issues that we face in Singapore right now. So there's obviously issues to do with race, uh, things to do with economics, you know, the economy, and uh, and just for our viewers to know as well that right now you're currently working in a research uh, is it fair to call it a research body yeah we call it an ai powered conversation platform it's called op which is short for opinion mm. yeah so it's op op yeah so the same way if you would like to say let's go on a zoom or let's google this if there is polarization in singaporean society or if there are divisions in society we will like citizens in singapore or any parts of the world to say, let's OP this. Mm. Yeah, so it's a place, uh, we call this the virtual town square of citizens, where they can gather and have a very wholesome and responsible discussion on issues that are very divisive, polarizing, or very complex in nature. And so that's why we built OP. It's an AI-powered conversation platform. Mm. Yeah. Great, yeah, so we, we definitely wanna uh, learn more about that and, and learn more about your journey. But first of all, uh, our opening question to you is, when was the first time in your life uh, when you felt that things shouldn't be the way they are? It's a multi-layered question. And the first memory I have of, I would say trauma, of like where there is this certain break in my expectations of how the world should be was I went, when I was in primary school uh, I took Malay, I, mm -hmm. my mother tongue is actually Hindi mm -hmm. and uh, I uh, very clearly remember this one examination I was studying for um, and uh, I was struggling with it and my mom knew a bit of Malay but she wasn't very proficient in it and when I went to her and asked her like can you help me with this? I've got an exam. And my mom just um, said, like, she can't help me because she wasn't that proficient as well, at all. Yeah, so that was where I felt like a little um, lonely. I felt um, as if I had to do everything by myself. Yeah, so that was the first instance. The next, I think, scar or moment where there was like this awakening was when I was in junior college. And was in the students' council, and in the students' council, you, you usually represent the voices of the people of the students to the administration. And I felt like uh, there was far more behind the scenes and in the culture of the entire education system that wasn't what I felt it should have been. Yeah. So those were like many instances, but it stemmed from the education system in Singapore and childhood. Mm. In, yeah, growing up and living in Singapore. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think there are a lot of people who would probably identify with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, maybe you can now tell us a little bit about yourself. Your, you know, maybe you know, from that point on, how, how did those incidents uh, influence your life journey and, and what you've gone on to do since then? Yeah, so um, I was born and bred in Singapore, uh, totally Singaporean. My mom was from India, dad Singaporean as well, and dad's dad as well Singaporean. So uh, I grew up uh, in the education system in Singapore, the formal education system in Singapore. I, um, uh, after junior college, went to national service. After finishing national service, I went overseas to study in France and Spain. I spent about four and a half years in France and a year in Spain. Mm. Yeah, so um, I am trained as an engineer. So I, in, in my time in France, I learned how to build uh, solar farms or wind farms. Yeah, so I specialize in clean and renewable energy when I was in France. 
uh, my specialization was resource conversion and energy efficiency. That was what I was taught in school, but most of the time in school, I wasn't even uh, doing environmental engineering. I was uh, interested in fintech. Oh. So yeah, the, that was in 2012 when I was in uh, Spain, uh, supposed to st study advanced mathematics, but I skipped a lot of that. And <laughs> I, I looked at the banking industry and the financial industry, and there's this whole idea of peer-to-peer Mm. Yeah, and how we can now, um, with information technology, bypass the banks yeah, and connect people amongst themselves. Mm. Yeah, lenders, borrowers, mm. people who have this currency with people who have another currency. So that was where I saw the power of technology in bypassing the high cost structure of banks and to make things a lot more efficient from the banking and financial industry point of view. Uh, after two failed experiences in startups, I then went back to Singapore to serve out my government bond with the Economic Development Board of Singapore. So uh, I spent a year in precision engineering, doing industry development and manpower strategies um, in EDB. Uh, after that, I spent the next or the subsequent four years in strategic planning department where I had the best time of my intellectual life. Hmm. I. Uh, uh, worked on uh, reinventing economics or rethinking economics from the neoclassical lens. Uh, worked on a uh, 30 year horizon future economic development strategies, uh, Singapore's connectivity strategies. Yeah, really, uh, the department I was in uh, it was called strategic planning, but the team I was in was called Skunk's Work. So the, the rejects of <laughs> the civil service, like you know, in, in EDB, they'll be like sent to this small department where they get to like tinker around and toy around and mm. question things. So it was a intellectually very stimulating time of my life, those four years. Mm. And uh, that was where I was exposed. I was exposed to degrowth in France, but in, in, it was in EDB where I really got very deep into neoclassical economics and the impact it had on our thinking in Singapore the damage it had on our social construct, on our environment. Yeah. So that was where I had a massive period of awakening. So just to interject here a little bit, because you know you use some really uh, interesting terms, right? Neoclassical thought, degrowth, which we actually, even me and Onsu have not even covered yet on our channel. So can you just go a little bit into you know, what's the difference between a new, uh, well, first define neoclassical economic thinking, that's one. And then after that, uh, maybe for degrowth, just a very short one introduction about what it is or what you experienced in France, right? Uh, tell it like a story so that way our viewers may understand better what degrowth means. Yeah, yeah so I want to go into what the economics textbook, mm. uh, what it expounds on neoclassical economics because mm. I'm not even economics trained. I'm an engineer by training. Yeah. But the, if, we, if we go slightly back in history, go back to Descartes' split between the mind and the body, and where the mind is able to model everything outside, yeah, even human beings and the economy as a machine. Yeah, when you start to see everything from this mechanistic point of view, like a machine paradigm, and you're able to then do optimization and modeling and simulation, just to make sure you can tinker around with different parts of this machine called the economy to optimize it for a certain purpose, that is what I feel is uh, the essence of neoclassical economics, where you don't model the economy as this interactions between human beings with nature, but rather as mere factors of economic digits and an interaction between supply and demand and trying to optimize for that from a very mechanistic point of view. That is what I, I, I call uh, and I, how I would explain neoclassical economics. And the way, one possible way to move away from this mechanistic paradigm of the economy is to look at it and to, from a very natural rainforest point of view, from, from, from the lens of nature. Nature can teach us a lot more about the economy than a machine or the mechanistic paradigm can. So that is, yeah. in essence, neoclassical economics. So yeah, just to elaborate a little bit more for viewers who may not be familiar with Descartes, I believe he was a 16th century French, French, French philosopher, philosopher and he was famous for uh, the phrase, I think, therefore I am. So he really identified the mind as the most important thing about ourselves. 
I think he also invented algebraic geometry. So you know, any any time you have a graph with x y coordinates, that's Descartes. Uh, and I think he also uh, thought of animals as machines. So he, he looked at life, and he he thought they were machines that could be understood simply. Um, so that's why you know you use the word mechanistic. That's basically a lot of it came from him. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I thank you for bringing up Descartes and. Uh, so do you, do you believe that our current dominant economic worldview, even in, in Singapore, is Cartesian, is influenced by Descartes? Very much so. I, I think we still look at the econom economy from a very math and economics point of view. We don't bring in the social sciences, sociology, anthropology, psychology, or even the arts. Yeah. So we don't bring the humanities and the arts into what is a dominant field, a field that is dominated by economics and mathematics. And I think we need to bring more humanity to something that is too mechanized and too machine-like. Yeah. And we need to stop. And I, I'm of the view that we still treat human beings in Singapore as mere factors of economic digits, where there is an overemphasis on this Thing, this illusory concept called GDP, growth domestic product, and optimizing for Singapore's GDP per capita. So you just divide GDP by the number of Singaporeans. If you just want to optimize for that, you want to show to the world that we've got a great economy based on just one indicator or a few indicators, which is just GDP or GDP per capita. And I think that is too unidimensional and too reductionist the point of view to understanding modeling or mapping the health of our economy. Yeah. So some Singaporeans will probably like, you know, may feel some sympathy with your, uh, with your arguments. Like today, I was in a Grab car and a driver was ranting all the way to me about how he's so disappointed with the current government because he thinks that all they do is care about money. And it's obviously a reflection, you know, even though he didn't word it in the way that you did, but it's clearly a reflection of the kind of sentiment that he feels like the government is focused on a certain outcome as a very instrumental or you know mechanized uh, outcome right so the question here is that you you've been to france you've been to obviously these other countries so perhaps for our viewers right can you tell us like whether you feel like uh different nations do pursue economic growth differently and whether you think that you know singapore right with all its uh especially with the current elite trying to justify that hey this is the way that this is the only way that we have to grow our country you know, can we actually uh, envisage like a different kind of model? Yeah, and is it really possible? So yeah, yeah. I think if we want to tackle this very complex issue, yeah. <laughs> it's a very complex issue to unpack, and I would love to unpack this. We need yeah. to look at it from a trauma-informed lens. I think yeah. So there is the trauma of the patriarchy. There is the trauma of neoliberalism, the trauma of capitalism, and then the trauma of colonialism, and all of this many types of trauma has shaped who we are as a nation and without having an unpacking and having a deep understanding of the, the, the traumatic incidents and ideologies that have shaped the way we view people, the way we view the economy, the way we view society or Singapore, it will be too reductionist or too, too limited a point of view. Yeah, so, so let me just yeah. uh, stop you there because I've, I've heard this uh, during your talk, right, which you gave and actually, there's a good question that came up to my head, which is how do you define trauma? Because to every Singaporean, when you mention all these words, right, trauma of uh, capitalism, trauma of patriarchy, trauma of uh, maybe even neoclassical uh, economic uh, 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 structures, right? Like, they might not understand. What do you mean by trauma? I feel fine. I live my life fine. What do you mean by trauma? You know, they may not feel that, you know, in their bones. And I worry that kind of language, you know, needs to be unpacked and, and made for people to understand. Do you have a way of trying to explain this? Yeah. The person I would turn to with regards to trauma is mm. uh, Dr. Gabor Mate, mm. uh, who has taught me a lot about trauma. Mm. And I began researching a lot about trauma from my own personal trauma. When I was, mm. I had a huge culture shock when I left Singapore and I went to France. So that was one culture shock. And then the second trauma was when I came back from France to Singapore and this <laughs> certain ideology, mm. yeah, a certain way of doing things and yeah. So I think I my personal experience with trauma was culture shock. Mm. Yeah. And there was this period of awakening that what I was thought 
was not necessarily like representing the true nature of reality or existence or, or truth. Yeah. So there are many versions of truth and I was probably fed a particular point of view or particular version of truth that need not be the right one. And that was the break in transparency, I think, for me, where when I went to France, I realized that people were living in a world that was so unique to them and that was so different from my own worldview. Yeah. So it was only when I broke out of the Singaporean mall or culture mm. where I realized that actually there's this invisible culture that we live in that can be rendered more visible and explicit if we explore other cultures and if we explore other societies and other ways of living, including indigenous cultures. Mm. Yeah. So for me, I think according to Dr. Gabor Mate, he defines trauma as not what happens uh, to you from an external shock point of view, but what happens to you from within you when something happens, when a traumatic incident happens. Something shifts within you and you can't really explain what that shift is. And that can be very simply put as trauma, where there is pain, a certain kind of pain, but when that pain manifests as a form of suffering and we start to dissociate from that suffering through addiction, for example, through materialism, through acquisitions, that's where trauma is a deeper root cause of symptoms that we see at a more visible layer, which is materialism or capitalism, or this desire for the five C's in Singapore, mm. this desire for status. Yeah, those are very visible layers or symptoms of an underlying issue which we can very simpl simplistically call trauma. Let me buttress that with actually one of my favourite uh, uh, movie moments actually. So one of my favourite local movies is Singapore Dreaming. Uh, it's done by Colin Goh and his wife. Uh, so there's one scene where the character, uh, she's like the daughter of the family and she's basically uh, belligering uh, her husband who's played by Lim Yi Bing, if I'm not wrong. And so what's happening is that like, um, the, this, the context is that it's a funeral of their father, of her father, sorry. And so the idea was that they, it was an assumption as if uh, the maid had stolen some funeral money, you know, the money that's usually given at funerals as a donation. So anyway, the idea is that it turned out that she was wrong. She, she had falsely accused the maid of stealing and she truly didn't steal money at all. And so the husband was sort of scolding the wife uh, and saying that like, you know, why are you like this? And the wife basically, you know, retaliated back, you know, saying uh, to the Limi Bing's character that, you know, you are poor, you are just an interest agent, you know, even, even if it's just a little bit of money, you know, you treat it like nothing. And then she said something to the effect of like, Singapore, everywhere is like that. Singapore is, you know, whatever is happening in terms of the trauma that you mentioned, the kind of anxiety, status anxieties, you know, she tried to make it sound like as if everywhere around the world is like that. And, you know, and when that moment, that moment in the, the film, uh, like it jutted out to me because I was like, no, that's so wrong. That's the Singaporean way of thinking, as if everyone in the world behaves like a Singaporean. And it's so not true, right? This particular idiosyncratic thing that we have about Kiasuism, chasing the five Cs, it's not universal. And it's something that I think now, with the way that you put it, yeah, it is a form of trauma. It's just that it doesn't come about necessarily like in a very big moment, like the way it did in the movie, but we do experience it, you know, insidiously, you know, and um, it's, it's just intrinsic, at least in terms of the way that we live our lives. Yeah, so I think that's a good way of, uh, well, at least for me, that's one moment that I felt captured uh, what you were saying. Yeah, yeah no, no, I think it's, it's important to like, yeah, just bring it down to earth for people. I mean, I'm not an expert on trauma, so I'm probably at risk of simplifying it too much. But on one level, I also understand trauma as things happen to us when we're young, you know, things happen to everybody and we develop survival strategies to cope with whatever happens to us, right? And whether it's being bullied in school or failing an exam, being made to feel ashamed about something, uh, having an unfair comparison to a friend. Uh, and then, you know, we have survival strategies that help us through those painful periods. But as we get older and we mature, somehow these strategies are built into our body. Like we don't let go of them. And, you know, so as a society, we need better wisdom and better awareness 
and better practices to help each other outgrow these immature strategies. And it's not, you know, like we have to honor them. They did help us at one point, but now we need to move beyond them. So then on a societal level, if you look at Singapore, you know, I think one of the things that collectively we as a nation had to do to survive in the past was we had to have this siege mentality where like, we have no natural resources, uh, we, had, we were separated from Malaysia, um, we really had to make a lot of sacrifices to get to where we are today. But, you know, perhaps now is a good time to reassess the situation and to ask what of these strategies that we use in the past are no longer adaptive to our present situation. This is so beautiful because development, the whole idea of development, right, from third world to first world, is a form of compensation for something deeper, which is inadequacy. When you feel that, when you feel this sense of scarcity and that you're inadequate or you're insecure, that's the moment where you want to compensate for it and you want to show to the world outside of you that you can be worth something. Yeah. And I think this is where the whole siege mentality that you talked about galvanized the entire nation so quickly to move from third world to first world, from a low income to a high income, a highly industrialized economy. Yeah. And so I think we can even question the whole notion of development, right? Like, was that even warranted? Was it even necessary? And why did we even do that? So I think for a lot of Singaporeans, their fear is that if we don't continue to keep up with this siege mentality, we will lose out, right? After all, that explains a lot of the quotes from especially our great supreme leader, Lee Kuan Yew, right? About how if we're not keeping up with our competitiveness, then our wives, our sisters will be maids in, a, in, in another country, right? So I guess, you know, the important thing that we want to address here is that is that kind of fear warranted, right? Uh, there are many other countries, sure, who are also as capitalistic as Singapore, but you don't see necessarily that, that same, you know, hyperlistic productivity drive and that kind of fear mentality as well. So, um, my question to you really is that: Do you think this can be somehow renegotiated, and and you know, um, can we get out of this uh, you know mindset that we seem to be trapped in? It's going to take a lot of work. Um, I think we can work across like multiple levels. Uh, the strategy needs to be multi-pronged. Um, if I want to convince a person who's so neoclassically trained that your GDP growth is not going to be affected, your KPIs are not going to be affected if you look at well-being or more humanistic ways of modeling the economy, then I think I have a fair shot of looking at the GDP equation and saying that in total factor productivity, there are ways to account for well-being, a more gracious society, care work. Yeah. So this is where we look at the entire dichotomy between production and productive capacity. I think we focus too much on production to the point that is stressing our productive capacity. People are burning out, mental health issues on the rise, people who are depressed, people who are not, people who don't feel a sense of meaning and fulfillment in their lives. So that's, yeah, that overdrive and emphasis on production is impinging of productive capacity, which also looks at total fertility rates. Yep. You know, because if you just focus so much on producing, then you're not focused on your own well-being, your own personal well-being and your productive capacity and your responsibility for raising a kid who will then contribute to production or productive capacity in the future. Yeah, so I think it's time for us to have a conversation on this dichotomy between production and productive capacity and now to explore and expand on this whole idea of productive capacity and look at many dimensions of productive capacity one of which which I'm an advocate for which is self-care which mm. is so important and so yeah I think I grew up thinking community is over self nation over self society over mm. self and I burnt myself out like yeah and that's also another layer to trauma and I feel like now only I'm recognizing that I can start to love myself I can start to accept myself I can start to take care of myself and it's okay so I think there's just so many layers to this. Yeah. So I think I have a fair shot at convincing the neoclassical economists 
but I think we need to do a lot more work uh, within community. I'm not going to be relying on state to change the thing. We need to now have community model the change it wants to see to the state, rather than banking on the state or even the markets. The capitalistic drives of the markets are just too strong for us to overcome because markets and states dominate in Singapore and we've put community down. So I think a huge lever for change for us would be community, where we start to now model a new way of relating with one another, which is essential to everything. Yeah, model a new way of even dealing with our pain and negative emotions. Like I, at this age, I've got so much struggles with redefining my relationship with emotions such as grief, anger, shame and guilt yeah so we can address it across multiple layers i think yeah very it's a multi-pronged strategy <laughs> <laughs> i want to take a step back uh and go back to your personal narrative i mean like uh we, you know you talk about your time in france and that's where you got exposed to some of these other ideas right could you say a little bit more about that because it's interesting because we just talked about descartes who was from france so you would think that uh, the French perspective would be totally, you know, mechanistic, but obviously you found it much more nuanced than that. It's a lot more nuanced. There is a massive revolution in France. It's called Le Mouvement La Décroissance, the degrowth. Yeah, and I was exposed to it in, I would say, 2007, 2008. I was having a chat with this person and I said that, like I was going to go back to the economic development part of <laughs> Singapore to grow Singapore's economy and he just like stumped me but how about like decroissance, have you heard of degrowth? like yeah we can't grow exponentially, there are limits to growth and I was like completely <laughs> taken aback by that <laughs> suggestion and that was my journey to la decroissance yeah and in, in France there's this saying travailler plus pour gagner plus you know so you work more to earn more yeah, or produit plus pour consommer plus. You produce more so that you can consume more. Yeah, but all of this caricatures have shown that it's just a, it's a circular argument. Yeah, you, there is no way out of it, and we can't have well-being incorporated in all of this. Yeah, so I think the French are multi-textured and multi-layered as a society. You have the neoclassical uh, thinkers. Definitely, but I think there is a massive part of society that has questioned it. Yeah, and that and level discourse in France has shifted. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think France is a very interesting society because you know, like on, on the one hand, I think from the outside perspective, sometimes we look down upon French people. We say French people are lazy. They have a poor <laughs> work ethic. You know, if anyone has ever been to France, like sometimes you don't get really good service in shops and and whatever and. I do have French friends who run businesses who complain about that too, but from this perspective of degrowth, it you know that actually it does make some sense to rebel against this system of perpetual productivity. You know, at Absolutely. what point, you know, should we actually allow ourselves to take breaks, to take vacations, to slow down, right? So I want to ask you, like, um, you know, we will go in, probably in, a, in another episode, we'll go uh, a deeper dive into degrowth and it would be good to have you on board uh, for that as well. But as it stands right now, right, you come back to Singapore after being exposed to these ideas in France, I'm sure you must have shared a couple of them with your personal friends, you know, and let's not talk about people who are necessary civil servants, just people on the ground, right? What do you feel is the reception to such ideas? And one very important thing is, do you get accused of Western importation of ideas? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I right. do. I do get in, yeah. Yeah, accused. Um, I, I don't even talk about degrowth in Singapore mm. because there's no point. Mm. Um, I look at it from a strengths and asset-based community development point of view right now, like with the social work uh, sphere mm. or the so social ecosystem, right? I think I try to bring out the assets and the strengths of people, then try to extract from them or exploit as much energy or production out of them. So I think I try to like, in my interactions with people in my organization or with my friends, I think the interactions are no longer extractive or exploitative or like what can we get out of something but more about how can we build productive capacity, how can we take care of our systems, uh, and how can I recognize the inherent gifts and talents 
that are within uh, my friends. Yeah, and what I just do is to shine light. Yeah, because we want to heal deeper layers of insecurity and scarcity. And the way to do that, right, is to appreciate and recognize the gifts that we have within ourselves. And to just shine light and to recognize and to, yeah, to just allow the conditions, create the conditions for the flourishing of people's potential. Can yeah. you give a practical example of this? Like perhaps some kind of project that you were engaged in where you felt like you did uh, draw on the strengths of uh, the people, the participants? Yeah, so I, I lead this things, this uh, series of uh, guided tours on Mount Faber. Mm. It's called Life Review Retreats. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it's, un it's, called, it's under this whole umbrella of term called soul probe, which is probing deeper uh, into your soul or your being and asking yourself what's your dharma and what's, your, what's the purpose of your life and you know, what is the meaning behind all of this. And there is a series of questions I guide people through, one of which is if money were not a concern, if you had all the money and all the resources you had in the world, what would you be doing? Like, yeah. So questions like that that just help jolt people out of their conditioning. Yeah. So that's what I do, like three day tours on Mount Faber Park. And mm. then we have like multiple stopovers and we do series of introspective and contemplative exercises where we go deep into ourselves and we ask ourselves like, why are we here? Did anyone answer their question with like, they want to just buy a house, a condo, <laughs> a car? <laughs> Yeah, how did, how, how, what were the, most of the common type of responses to such a question? If they had all the money in the world, what would they do? I did this with my mentor at the Art of Living Foundation, Nishi. Uh, she's the founder of this interior design and architecture firm called Studio Ik. Yeah, and she, she does not see architecture or interior design, her business, as uh, a, a, a company that goes about like redesigning uh, the, the interiors or the aesthetics of places, that's no longer her mission. Her mission is to create safe healing spaces for people to be at ease with themselves. Yeah. So architecture and interior design is a means to a much deeper, much more fulfilling and meaningful end, which is to create, which is to create safe healing spaces for people to blossom to their fullest potential, for example. So that's one shift that happened. But it was never about the money. It was never about <laughs> mm. the the car or mm. yeah. Mm. I'm well. I guess you know anyone who would go on these journeys with you would be a self-selected group anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, I actually do think that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so let's talk a bit about your work in uh, OP, right? right? Yes. So you've done quite a lot of um, what do you want to call it? Like uh, research groups? Is that uh, focus group discussions? Right. And it's quite a variety of questions you're, you're tackling right now. You've got racism, um, my guess is inequality. Um, uh, what, what else has been new for you or something that's pertinent uh, in your work? Yeah, so and maybe you can also start by explaining how OP works. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Exactly. So OP is, uh, I, I call, we're, we're building a new discipline. It's a new science. We call it social seismography. Yeah, so social and seismography. So seismography is a science of a study of earthquakes and how can you prevent earthquakes before they happen and also how do you then uh, make buildings more resilient when earthquakes do happen and underlying the signs of uh, uh, in the science or discipline of seismography you've got seismometers mm. seismometers track underlying tectonic plate movements in geology right and when these plates these tectonic plates rub against one another they create fault lines and with these fault lines, then it generates an earthquake. And then these seismographs, uh, these seismometers pick up on this and then relay this to uh, the entire nation. And then this is for preparation, for prevention and for, uh, for resilience. Yeah. And we apply that to the social landscape of Singapore. And based on the conversations, we've run multiple conversations with Singaporeans. We've seen multiple fault lines yeah, or areas of divisions across the race. We're seeing divisions across class, uh, across income levels, uh, gender, climate, the climate activists versus those who are uh, non-climate, mm. yeah. uh, cancel culture, mm. you know, about freedom of speech. Uh, we did one on uh, race and racism as mm. well. So we've done a, a series of conversations, migrant workers right. and uh, the 
the, the locals in Singapore and we did another one on private data and public good. Mm. Yeah, so we've done quite a number of conversations and we're seeing a lot of this fault lines in Singapore. Race is one massive fault line that we seldom talk about uh, because it's deemed as too insensitive. Sorry, too sensitive, my right. apologies. Yeah. Too sensitive. Yeah, but underlying all of this, right, I, I've come to realize, looking at the data, I look at the fault lines, right, that we're a very class conscious society. There's a lot of status anxiety in our society. Yeah, and if I can do what it takes to heal this status anxiety, I think we'll have massive shifts along all the other lines mm. of divisions, race, gender. Yeah. So I think that's my biggest learning. Yeah. OP functions based on a very simple mechanism. It's the hybrid between a survey and a focus group discussion. So you have many people responding from Singapore. You've got 500 people, but Singaporeans have a say in the design of the survey questions. Mm. It's no longer the responsibility or the prerogative of the investigator of the research to frame the questions because that's where bias in survey question sets in. Citizens get, citizens get to co-create survey questions together with OP or the people whom we do uh, conversations with. Yeah. So that's the whole yeah. idea of social seismography. Pick up on this fault lines and to then have conversations to heal these divisions before they lead to massive earthquakes in our society. And we are seeing one happening across the race right. with mm -hmm. the recent incidents on social media. So, yeah. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. Um, so, okay, why don't you, because there's quite a number of issues you pointed out there, so we probably can't go through all of them, but let's take the one that obviously is most pertinent and it's really relevant in, in our current discourse, which is racism, right? So in your work, uh, what have you found, you know, what are the kind of key takeaways you've found which you don't think is common knowledge out there, that could be even contrary to conventional wisdom, you know? Yeah, uh, the one very important insight uh, that is of high consensus among Singaporeans is that the government is overly cautious mm. when it comes to discussions around race and racism. Mm. And we should not feign ignorance on its existence. Mm. I think we've swept it under the carpet for so many years. We need to now slowly and carefully address it. Yeah. And citizens, contrary to elite opinion, are ready for more open, wholesome conversations on race and racism. Yeah. So now, and, and another thing that was of consensus, high consensus among Singaporeans, was agreement that racism does exist in Singapore. There was about 80 to 90% agreement. Yeah. So you have got all these expert opinions, right, in ivory towers, saying that, oh, racism is not a serious issue, probably it does not exist, or it's not as serious relative to gender or climate or any other issues, or even COVID-19. Mm. I would say race is far more endemic, far more insidious than, let's say, COVID-19. Yeah, and we need to call out the disproportionate amount of media attention that COVID-19 is receiving vis-a-vis -vis deeper discussions on mental health, class divisions, race divisions, gender inequality, or even climate conversations. Yeah, I mean, these are all multiple overlapping pandemics that have been going on for a while. <laughs> and I think COVID is just the one that has erupted onto the scene very suddenly and got all the attention, but you know, hopefully it's also triggering us or catalyzing us to look at all these other pandemics that we have been suffering from. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious how you actually get people to take part in these interactive surveys. Because I'm someone who like, if someone comes up to me to fill a survey, I'm like, no, I, <laughs> I don't have time, right? So yeah, yeah how, how do you get actually people to participate in this? Exactly. So we, we've done quite a fair bit on the, the on our research on uh, UI and UX, on like even how people respond to questionnaires and surveys. And OP is like the TikTok of surveys. Yeah. So TikTok, it, there's this whole generation of people with shorter attention spans who are glued to TikTok <laughs> because it's very engaging, right? And so we've made OP uh, as engaging as TikTok. Yeah. So the traditional surveys are like, let's say, YouTube videos or very old traditional kinds of videos. Yeah, that, that maybe 
uh, longer, mm. yeah, and don't cater to shorter attention spans. And OP caters to shorter attention spans, and it's fun. You are answering a survey, a series of questions without even feeling as if you're you're answering one. You don't even feel that you're you're uh, yeah answering a survey. And beyond that, it is participatory in nature. You get to submit statements that then can, after that, circulate back into the conversation for other people to respond to. So you now have agency in dictating the trajectory of the discourse. There is some form of responsibility. And beyond that, OP is also a consensus builder because we highlight points of common ground and divisions. And so all of this is very important in changing the entire dynamics of discourse in Singapore. I feel we've emphasized and we've been putting too much attention on the content of discourse, but not so much on the container that is holding the content of this course. And what we need more of R&D in Singapore is in redesigning the container for this course. This space that we've created here, breaking the spell, is one very important space or container for this course. And what we have, what's happening here is a very beautiful dynamic that is modeling back to the rest of society of how can we better relate, better interact, better connect, and have better conversations with one another. Yeah. Oh. So that's how, how OP, mm. with <laughs> breaking the spell, <laughs> is redesigning not only the content of this course, yeah, but the entire container or the space for this course. Wow, no, no, that's, I, great. I, I <laughs> that's what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, great class. Great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me um, go back to the racism thing. So, you know, this is just my own way of trying to make a sense of what uh, I think is a stumbling... Um, you know, gap in our discourse on race. I think that for a lot of Singaporeans, uh, as what you mentioned just now, uh, which is very uh, heartening to hear that, you know, they are ready and they are open for more honest discussions. And I fear that, like, I think what to a lot of Singaporeans is that, okay, racism exists, but it's just individual acts of racism. So perhaps I know a neighbor or I know a relative who said something racist, and yeah, I think I need to be able to call that out. So what I feel uh, this this whole way of thinking about it is that it misses the mark, right? Because it's very easy to spot someone and say, oh, this is a racist person and, you know, we should do something about him and that's pretty much it. And I'm actually not in favour of having very heavy uh, legal penalties on, on someone engaging in racist behaviour because I don't think that's the right way to uh, resolve the, the, the situation. Obviously, it's a lot more structural than that. So what I'm curious to hear from you is whether from your participants, do they look at it beyond just individual acts? So that's number one. And two, whether they're actually open to looking at institutionalized racism. And that's very hard for people to understand. We can have an hour-long yeah. conversation <laughs> yeah. on this because yeah. I've got the entire analytics dashboard, but just a few points uh, on structural racism in Singapore or systemic racism in Singapore. First point of division, very high divisive statement is this statement that I have a fair starting point Mm. Uh, due to my race mm. we notice a massive split between the Indians and the Malays mm. who do not feel that they have a fair starting point in life because of their race versus the Chinese who feel that they have a fair starting point in life because of their race so this is one major split that we recognised another major split is on whether we should preserve the CMIO Identification, mm -hmm. classification, identity Chinese, classification. Chinese, Malay, Indian, others. Chinese, yeah. Malay, Indian, and others. Yeah. And what we notice, uh, this is a very divisive statement, but this is where the crowdsource intelligence of the citizens came in, and it blew my mind. Citizens know a lot more than policy makers who are formulating laws or policies. I think we need to now move towards a paradigm where citizens can bring their intelligence. And there's this beautiful comment by a participant. The CMIO framework could be used for racial intermingling. So racial policy or housing policy, right? Where you, you make sure that there are certain quotas to be met so that people of different races intermingle. Education policies, where you make sure that there is sufficient intermingling. So it is important to that extent where you encourage intermingling but not to the extent where you then identify people based on their race, on their identity cards. 
So you don't need to have CMIO on people's identity cards, but you can still collect information on how different races are performing uh, along social or economic lines and see if something is festering and something needs addressing. But you shouldn't look at it from an identification point of view because when you identify, that's where it leads to potential stereotypes. And that's where this whole universe of racial discrimination or prejudice starts with macroaggressions, then microaggressions and nanoaggressions at very subtle, very covert layers, yeah, which could even be unintentional. Yeah. So I think those are like the two very important splits. Mm. Fair starting point and the second one on whether the CMIO framework is still relevant. There are a few other very divisive statements. The third one was on whether we are open to having more honest conversations. Mm. That was a little divisive. Yeah, but I think based on like the, 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 my summary and my analysis of it, this were like yeah, the key areas. Yeah, I actually like the very first uh, statement, the idea about having a fair starting point in life. Uh, Onsu and I want to talk about the concept of uh, meritocracy. And I think one of the major you know, myths that we have to deconstruct in Singapore is the idea that everyone has a fair starting point in life. Uh, this obviously feeds into the idea that, hey, if you just work out at uh, you know, what you do in life, you know, you'll be able to get ahead and perhaps be you know, in front of societal uh, ladder, but um, obviously we would need to take a lot more time to actually kind of deconstruct that and to even question the idea whether this model of meritocracy that we pursue in Singapore, whether it's really viable for everyone, you know, from all different sorts of uh, economic backgrounds or race. Yeah. I did come across an interesting uh, example of what privilege means, and this was in the US context. I think someone wrote it on Facebook or something, but the analogy they used was that um, Privilege is like you're on the roads driving a car, you know, and there's someone who's riding a bicycle and, you know, you driving a car, like, you don't even have to consider the person riding a bicycle, you know, you're just doing your normal thing, you know, but to the person riding the bicycle, wow, they have to really be, watch where they're going because if, if you, you know, just drive into them, that's it, it's over. I mean, they have, uh, you know, an accident that, you know, really hurts them, right? So to someone who has privilege, it's invisible. You're not aware of it. You're just doing your normal thing. But to the person who doesn't, it's a whole world of difference, right? And so I thought that was a good example to show why people who do have privilege or do have you know, this advantage starting out in life, they don't see it that way in the same way. Yeah, and I think we see privilege manifesting in uh, dimensions other than just race. It could be based on height, whether you have hair or you don't have hair, whether there are certain definitions of success in society. So there are many other lines across which we can draw these divisions or this, this idea of power and privilege. Yeah, where there's one group that deserves more or that is more privileged and another group that is probably marginalised. So marginalisation and privilege, uh, it's not just exclusive to race. Yeah, it could be also in the dimensions of gender and many other things in life. And the more nuanced and textured and understanding we can have of privilege, the more conscious we become of, of this. Yeah, and the more we can name it, the more then we can then go back into our lives and we can examine ourselves and be more introspective and yeah, make shifts. Yeah, I mean, like one person could be privileged in one dimension, but not privileged in another. You know, like uh, you could be uh, Chinese and have privilege because you were raised, but then you could be from a working class background and not have class privilege, right? So yes, it's agree. actually very complex. I would yes, even make it uh, like more simpler than that. I think like, for example, right now with the current discussions on racism, like if I see an ethnic minority say that, hey, I don't feel like, you know, Singapore is a racist society. Sometimes all you got to look at is his class level. If it's very up there, if he's going to elite schools, he's been very comfortably uh, residing in very uh, privileged positions of power, of course the person is not going to experience any tinge of racism. That's compared to someone of the same race as him, but working, you know, having a working class background and having to toll through you know, all the various challenges out there as a, uh, you know, as a lower working class of society. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with the time that we have left, uh, why not let's go into this, the, the last point you just made, yeah. right? So 
the whole idea is that you know we want to have more honest conversations. So I want to ask you, like, do you see, given that we both have some background in civil service, do you see the civil service being? Uh, is it possible to even reshape it to remodel it in such a way that you know uh, it can be open to that kind of discussion? Yeah, and basically for you, obviously with OP, you guys do have some uh, working relationship. Is that fair to say? Yes, we do. So we do work with like. Um OP is really looking at bringing on a form of democracy that's more participatory, inclusive, and consensus-based. Yeah, our form of democracy in Singapore is very majoritarian, and I think we need to involve more voices of citizens into uh, decisions on policy uh, or discussions in parliament. I think there's too much. I think uh, the government's version of citizen consultation is... Can I just say it's one-sided? It's one-sided. <laughs> it is yeah. one-sided. It is, yeah. yeah. And I say that even though I used to work in the ministry, yeah, you know, because uh, it's kind of like basically a channel where, okay, you give me feedback and that's it, you know, and then I take it back and I do whatever I want to do with it in terms of the data and I spill out something. And I've seen many times uh, in, in the sense that the kind of data that we collect Sometimes not everything is shared, and there's actually very interesting bits of data which runs contrary to the government uh, narrative, and they don't want to share that. That perhaps Singaporeans actually do think in a very different way. Yeah, I think because of this unidimensional form of meritocracy and this culture of individualism and competition that we've created in Singapore society, the civil service has an elite class that I fear is disconnected from ground sentiments, and it is in their interest to connect back to ground sentiments. And this is one way uh, in which conversations don't need to be one way, right? Where I listen to you and it goes into, it goes into this policy black hole. And then I, and the, the bad, the, 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 the uncomfortable thing about this is whatever they produce at the end of it does not reflect the raw mm. insights that were gathered at the citizen consultation stage. So there's a massive disconnect and what I suspect is there's this filtering up the chain of command. Things are being filtered at the, as they move up the chain of command and it's like Chinese whispers or it's yep. as if, yeah, it loses its meaning and tr with people who are very neoclassically trained, very technocratic in yep. nature, it misses the point that there are lived experiences of citizens that are very important to take into consideration in formulating policies the qualitative aspects of listening to citizens, of getting crowdsourced views and ideas is very important. We're, but I think we have too much of an emphasis on quantitative data, decision making. And from a technocratic elite point of view, which is a manifestation of a unidimensional form of meritocracy, look at the emphasis on STEM vis-a-vis -vis the humanities and the arts in selecting the best of our uh, students mm. to become scholars who will then get into the civil service and then who have a right of passage to becoming elites, the, the governing elite of our country. Yeah, so I think it's, it's very textured and we need to reconnect back to ground sentiments. And it cannot begin with the civil service, it needs to begin from young, where parents don't perpetuate class divides by mm. <laughs> vying for certain districts or primary schools <laughs> which are more favourable for a uh, student's uh, outcome, educational outcomes yeah. or mm -hmm. mm. any other outcomes yeah. in life. I, I, I really like your sort of image of you know, this, uh, like this process of how uh, citizens' opinions get filtered up and it's like at each step of the way, um, the, the person who's doing the filtering doesn't think they're actually doing that much filtering, right? It's just a little bit. <laughs> mm. And then, you know, so you can't really blame any single person in the system. They each think, oh, it's not, I'm not, you know, falsifying things too much. But by the time you get to the top, it's actually like the distance from the bottom is immense, right? So it's really not about blaming any one individual. Even the people at the top are probably not that guilty, but it's the whole system that we've caught ourselves up in. 
which is why I like to use the safe word. We need to look at things from a trauma-informed lens. <laughs> so we are all traumatized as a nation. Let's admit it and let's now go on a journey of healing. <laughs> <laughs> you elite, you need healing. I am not an elite. I also need healing. But in order to heal, we need to heal collectively. We need to come together, have conversations, and we need to grieve together. We need to air our grievances and we need to connect better and relate with one another better. I'm just going to disagree on the statement about the <laughs> elites. I'm not going to say they're traumatized. I think they're very comfortable where they are. Uh, but anyway, two points I just want to uh, add as a response to what you just said. So, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, I think there should be more uh, um, collaborative effort, organic, uh, on, from the ground kind of effort, grassroots efforts, you could say, uh, to create a kind of space, right, conversational space. I guess what I would say to that is, uh, unfortunately, they, we are structurally impeded from doing that. So if, for example, if tomorrow I want to go to my HDB void there and organize a very raw, let's get together and have a conversation, I'm very sure that you know, that will not be looked at upon lightly, right? And probably would not be allowed. So that's really one uh, structural get, uh, uh, blockage, right? And then two, um, going back to what Ansu you was talking about, I guess that's the idea, right, which is, like it goes back to everything like from whether it's environmentalism or the education system if even me as a parent i try to reject the system i go against the system it doesn't affect much change because all i'll be is just maybe a possible model to my friends but most of them are probably not going to agree with it so you know to me like i think we, we can't help but feel like as if we're stuck right if i want my child to get ahead in life i have to conform to the system somewhat i can try to find some leeway but it's not very much. So what I feel is that like, you know, besides having the conversations, the conversations need to lead to a predictable outcome, an outcome where we actually do force change in the system. Because unless that changes, like, you know, we are constantly still running on that treadmill and making, yeah, sure, small individualistic changes on our own lifestyles, but it's not really affecting, effective, uh, affecting society at large. Yeah, I mm. think to respond to that, I feel like, a lot of my, the next, the, the work I'm going to do in the next few decades is about um, opening up opportunities for access, for exposure, and for multiple pathways. Because as a community, I think we can do a lot more to expose our younger generation to other definitions of success. Mm. Uh, to the fact that actually they have inherent gifts and talents that can be harnessed. Yeah. And then, so that's exposure, right? I think there needs to be a lot more exposure. The same way I was exposed to a different culture and way of life in France. I think we can now start according the younger generation exposure. Then access, which is now certain groups of people in society have access to opportunities of power or resources. And we can now do our part to open up path or access for underprivileged community. So that's another thing that we can do. And the third one, which is multiple pathways, I think we now need to give the younger generation the belief that, you know, there's no competition out there. Like you're not competing with someone else. The only person you're competing with is yourself, you know, and like have fun in this journey and discover what you want to do in life. And your pathway to success is unique to yours. Yeah, and I feel in Singapore, we have this uni, dimensional or this singular model of success we, which we need to remove? There, there is this uh, campaign, um, I can't remember which year I saw it, but it featured like pretty notable celebrities and they held up their PSLE scores, if oh. I'm not wrong, and it was something like, I can't remember the hashtag exactly, but it's something to the effect of like, grades don't define me. So even though I may have a very bad PSLE score or O-level score, but look at me now, like I'm successful. and. I mean, it's very touching, and I do like to see uh, that kind of campaign, obviously, because it uh, dovetails very well with what you're talking about. Uh, it's just that, you know, it's obviously not a very official campaign by the government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I think. And, and I think that, you know, we, we do need that very huge cultural shift. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and uh, you're right, it's a multi pronged approach. Uh, you know, you do need uh, various kinds of efforts, you know, just to attack at the ethos of this uh, mindset. Yeah, no, uh, I think this is a good point to, to end the conversation, even though we could keep going. But uh, I think we already suggested to you before you know, we started that um, we really love your ideas and uh, you know, it would be great if you could come back again as a, as a guest to continue you know, uh, deep dives into specific topics or even as a co-host uh, and collaborator. Um, so 
Just want to add yeah. that uh, to our viewers because uh, Kumar, uh, sorry, Santosh has been uh, been the main person commenting on our videos, <laughs> watching all our videos. That's why he gets the privilege. So if you want the privilege as well to be on the show, do the same thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, watch our videos and comment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's been a privilege. Yeah, and let's work on transforming the container of this. Yes, course. the container. The container. Yeah. <laughs> the container spell. I like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Let's do that. <laughs>